from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Gleb Yushin joining me from the US. Gleb, the way I like to do it usually is I... Give the guests, you know, the time and, uh, you know, the space to introduce themselves because I believe no one can introduce another one other than themselves. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and thank you again for being a guest on the CTO show. Oh, thank you, Matt, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's very special for me because it's my first podcast ever. So oh, wow. I'm, yeah, I'm Gleb Yushin, uh, Chief Technology Officer and the founder of Sila. So our company develops and manufactures next generation materials for lithium ion batteries to power and provide high performance to electric vehicles, to uh, electronic devices, allow them to be both charged faster and run longer on a single charge. So when our technology is implemented, there are numerous benefits, not only to consumers, but also to car makers, uh, battery cell producers and the environment. So for example, the car makers can not only differentiate their vehicles from competitors, but also make them much more desirable and therefore accelerate the transition to renewable energy in transportation. At the same time, the battery makers, you know, without any additional investment in equipment or personnel, can increase output of their factories in gigawatt hours, can increase revenues, and also reduce CO2 emission while producing these batteries. So in short, our industrialized and scaled scientific innovations enable breakthrough products today that will benefit our environmental impact tomorrow. That's great, Gleb, like, and thank you for sharing this. Now, maybe it's a little bit, um, you know, traditional question, but I'm always um, curious to ask my guests, yeah, you know, what, what brought you to, to technology and, um, you know, uh, what, what was the journey that led you to, to, uh, to be now at uh, CLS? Well, I started my journey as assistant professor of material science at Georgia Tech, and this is the largest engineering school in the United States. Uh, so I joined uh, Georgia Tech in 2007, and I was particularly interested in studying different type of battery chemistry, so-called conversion chemistry, that theoretically may unlock full potential of lithium ion batteries, but was known to degrade very rapidly. So I first focused on understanding fundamental mechanisms responsible for such degradations. And when I started to deeply understand these mechanisms, I also concluded that regular simple materials might not be able to, pre to prevent uh, battery failures in this case. But I thought that we can come up with creative approaches in composite material synthesis to minimize or maybe even completely avoid such degradations. And, um, you know, unfortunately at that time, in the battery industry and battery science was very conservative. And I was repeatedly told that the industry is very mature and there is almost nothing to innovate on. And so the idea mm -hmm. of using composites and certainly non-composites as battery materials was almost uh, unthinkable. Um, and similarly, the idea of using synthesis methods from other industries, such as chemical vapor deposition or chemical vapor infiltration to produce such non-composites was basically out of question. Um, so I was told in numerous very confident voices that this would be too expensive or impractical or that nobody needs it now and likely for a good reason. And I was told that maybe not, nobody needs a better battery because it's already quite good. Um, but, you know, I questioned the statements and eventually found them to be, to be erroneous. Um, you know, at the same time, I, myself, I had no industrial experience. So mm -hmm. my initial, my initial thought was maybe to find a large chemical company that may be interested to further develop and scale up our scientific ideas, you know. But after talking to many people, I learned that it's not that simple. And there may be three main challenges. Um, and the first, maybe the biggest one is that after decades of moving heavy industries 
out of the United States. Many companies almost forgot how to bring technologies from the lab to factories. Um, okay. you, know, some, you know, some, for example, still do research, but you know, when the inventions then sit on the table because of the large cultural and communication barriers formed between different departments, which need to be all collaborating and involved uh, to drive innovations. So like strategy, research development, finance, manufacturing, and so forth. And you know, overcoming such barriers becomes even more challenging when the production is overseas. Um, you know, yeah, second is that the development and scale up may require more time and resources that than initially budgeted. And so which on its own might kill the initiative. And, and finally, the interest of the large company or the interest of your champion within the large company may change over time. And, you know, as eventually the project may no longer be a priority. So, you know, the probability of success may become small and which was, you know, very frustrating to hear and realize at, at that time. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear from you. But now, you know, like, uh, let, let's go one step uh, back, uh, Gleb, and, you know, for, for the people who, you know, you know, might be new to, to these terms. So if you can explain to us, you know, this new lithium ion chemistry in, as they say, in layman's term, like, um, and, uh, you know, uh, why it represents such a significant breakthrough? Well, conventional lithium ion batteries rely on so-called, um, intercalation phenomena. And, um, so where you insert lithium ions into the crystal structures. And so the more lithium these crystal structures can hold, the higher will be the capacity of the batteries and higher will be energy stored in the battery. But there is a limit. So you need to have quite a few atoms to store a single lithium ion. So for the mm -hmm. anode, for example, you need six carbon atoms to store a single lithium ion. And for example, for new chemistry, for silicon, let's say, one silicon atom can store four or even more lithium ions. So there is significant difference in this capability to store lithium ions. And so, you know, atomically it's a very large difference by weight is about three times difference. Um, uh, oh, by weight, sorry, it's about 10 times difference and by volume it's about three times difference. But the challenge is that when you insert lithium in this chemistry, in this conversion chemistry, the particles expand and um, they may crack, may undergo all sorts of degradations. And so, you know, the reversibility of this insertion extraction of lithium becomes uh, much harder. And so that's why we had to come up with new ways to produce the materials, produce composites to overcome this uh, degradation phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, good to hear from you, Gleb. Now, one thing, you know, I, while preparing, so I, I get to know that, you know, you had led a partnership with Mercedes. So how this uh, collaboration is going to, to shape the future of automotive batteries? Well, that's right. So, uh, the Mercedes announced last year that, uh, it's going to use, um, our material, our technology for its legendary G wagon, um, mm -hmm. which is very special vehicles, right? It's a flagship car and Mercedes always uses the latest and the best technology available, which is proven, uh, to power it on um, its, um, and so, you know, with this, with our technology, we can enable, you know, longer range, faster, uh, faster, uh, better performance and faster charging. And so, uh, this will be our entrance to the market. Um, and so once you have it there, typically Mercedes and other companies, they transition the new technologies from luxury vehicles to premium vehicles and eventually to mass market vehicles. So over time, our technology is going to power all, uh, types of, of vehicles on the road. That's, that's great. And I think you, you have decided to open a very large facility, right? For, uh, you know, doing the, um, you know, performing the growth of, of, uh, uh, of the company, right? Uh, it's a pretty large facility. Uh, it's going to operate in less than two years and, you know, by 2028, phase three is going to produce enough and other materials for up to 150 gigawatt hour worth of batteries annually. So for over uh, 1 million electric vehicles per year. And even at that time, you know, it's going to be a small fraction of the overall market. So it's kind of the large facilities, the huge facilities, but it's still the first step. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm curious also, like, um, because like it's, it's more chemistry, but 
you know, like what other technologies I, I would say, because, you know, like I'm sure like you need, you need to leverage other technologies as well um, in manufacturing and, you know, in, in design. So what are like some of the other technologies, you know, as, as Sina, you rely on to, to bring this to the market? I mean, we have to work with our partners. And so, um, you know, we design our own equipment, but we work with engineering firms to manufacture this equipment. Um, you know, initially we actually at early stages, we design and produce our equipment ourselves. Uh, and because we thought that you know, we have the smartest engineers, we have amazing scientists, so we can come up with the best way to produce, uh, to produce reactors. And, you know, which could potentially be true, but also when you work with experienced manufacturers, they, you know, through 20 decades of, you know, decades of improvements, they, you know, they learn how to predict timelines and how to produce, to produce really reliable equipment. So this was very important for us uh, to have this transition. So our partnership with um, engineering firms are, are, is very critical. We also have partners in um, uh, cell makers. So in order to implement our technologies and, and power electric vehicles, we need to work with cell makers. And so uh, they have to adopt our technology and you know, we designed in such a way that it will be drop-in replacement. So they wouldn't need to change the way they're producing batteries. They don't need to change equipment that they need to implement our technology, but it is still a change. And so, you know, we have to uh, kind of rely on their goodwill and their desire to innovate together with us. Uh, so we rely on them. And then, you know, the car makers are also conservative. Um, and so there is a kind of barrier for observation. So we need, you know, we need them to be excited about this technology. Um, and so um, it honestly takes like five years to, um, to like develop materials and um, uh, implement this new technology in electric vehicles because of so many numerous testing that you have to go through, you know, from quality control to um, uh, reliability, to safety testing on, you know, on both cells and packs and, and cars. So, mm -hmm. you know, lots of moving parts there and it's, it's not kind of overnight success. Yeah. Yeah, definitely it is. <laughs> it's like long, uh, long effort, I would say. Now, you know, like I, I like this topic because when I was you doing solo episodes, like I didn't have guests at that time when I started a couple of months back, I think I covered, you know, sustainability and environment in one of the episodes. So how do oh, you yes. see your company and technology align with the global sustainability goals, especially, you know, in reducing carbon emissions and promoting cleaner energy solutions? I mean, it's our mission, you know, our mission is to power the world's transition to clean energy. Yes. Um, and fortunately, there is a, there was a significant change in the worldview um, that triggered technological change. So you know, the world we change was the realization, global realization that transition to electric vehicles is happening no matter what, and it's happening quite fast. And, you know, when we started SILA in 2011, we believed in this transition, but the world did not. And so some of our investors, you know, not our investors, some of the investors predicted that no more than 5% of cars would be electric. Um, you know, so 95% of cars would remain powered by combustion engine in 2050. And, and now this feels like a joke, but at that time, this was a reality. It was very painful and we were fortunate to get remarkable investors with long view who spent time to focus on business fundamentals, um, but they were the minority. And, and so once the world realized this, this transition is happening and happening fast, people also realized that the scale of battery manufacturing needs to increase by hundred times or more. And so many raw materials that people used in the past might not be available in large quantities in the future, especially in relatively short timelines of maybe a few decades. And furthermore, you know, when initially COVID hit and later, you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, greatly disrupted the supply chain. And so the EV and battery industries faced all the supply chain challenges. And now there is a global agreement uh, of the need to rely on onshore rather than offshore manufacturing of both batteries and critical battery components. So, you know, and, and therefore there is alignment, I think overall, that we need to rely on raw materials that are inexpensive, that are globally available in large quantities and where we should ideally use battery materials that can be recycled economically. So we should use battery chemistry that can be recycled economically. 
And so the part of this realization in the United States was that SEAL received uh, a hundred million dollar award uh, from the Department of Energy. So they were recipient of the first set of projects Biden, funded by the uh, President Biden's infrastructure law to expand domestic manufacturing of batteries for electric vehicles and grid with a focus on domestic processing of materials and components that are currently imported from other countries. So we definitely have very high alignment with where the world is now, but we didn't have this alignment, you know, when we started 12 years ago. Now, one question that might arise here, you know, especially like, and, um, you know, I like to, to, it's not like about challenging, but, you know, some voices comes and say, you know, like, but this is also chemical and, you know, it's not safe. So tell me more about how you ensure the safety and reliability with, with the technology like this uh, uh, lithium ion chemistry that you, you explained about just moving back. Um, I mean, overall, as maybe I mentioned that it like takes five years to qualify batteries. There are so many tests. There are so many quality controls that you have to implement. So we visualize you know, digital manufacturing for quality control and, and statistical process monitoring. Um, we get audited by, by car makers. There are so <laughs> many, you know, we hired some of the best people uh, in quality control, right? To ensure safety. And it's also kind of embedded a little bit in our DNA because you know, it's one of our commitments is uh, to focus on environment, health, safety, and security, because we need to protect our colleagues. We need to protect our customers. We also need to protect our partners and our communities. And so this is what we do. This is our commitment. That's good to hear. Now, I'm interested, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm sure like you have uh, a, a dynamic market and, uh, you know, competition. So with, with other companies that might, uh, you know, be here and there, how do you maintain, you know, your competitive uh, edge? Um, we innovate, uh, we scale. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think the key was that maybe it took us longer to get where we are, but we focused on um, developing technologies that is easier to scale. Still hard and hard by technologies in in, you know, heavy industries scale up is, is long, it's not software, um, but nonetheless, compared to other technologies, the barriers are much smaller. So our materials are drop in replacement. So again, there is no changes in the processing uh, of them that you can just replace conventional materials for lithium ion batteries with our materials and you get this boost in performance. Um, you know, second is that we utilize um, globally available precursors that are inexpensive. Uh, and, you know, we use, um, you know, volumetric manufacturing methods that have become very inexpensive at large scale. Um, and so, you know, when you go to large scale, you know, you have to keep innovating, but you also have to provide value to, uh, to end customers. You have to provide value to vehicle makers. You have to provide value to, uh, battery makers. And so everybody has to make money, make profits. And so your materials have to become cheaper and cheaper over time. And this is what we have. We have several phases. You know, phase one of this you know, battery production facilities is most like the materials are going to be slightly more expensive at phase two. And so we, we serve initially like luxury markets, then they're going to serve premium markets and finally mass market. But if you don't design your processes or materials that can go to this very low cost for mass market it is, then your impact is going to be small. And so some companies focus on kind of high performance no matter what, and they have to overcome lots of barriers for adoption. And also, I don't see any pathway for them to become cost competitive for mass markets. So we had these thoughts, you know, from the very beginning. And so and again, it is, took us longer time. We had more restrictions in our technology, but once we developed it, I think it's, the it's path will be faster. And so we'll see who is going to innovate um, better and who is going to um, win in the market. Yeah, that's good. We will see all together now. You you just mentioned something a few seconds ago, you know, about what people were expecting 10 years back or more. Um, when do you see, you know, a more massive adoption for electric vehicles? I mean, in a reasonable way and, you know, without talking about, you know, what some governments are doing from, you know, forcing people. But I mean, as a market you've, you've been maybe following for a long time, you know, reasonably when we can see more adoption. I would say the predictions for adoption improve every single time. So we, when we started the company, we had this uh, wild dream that 
uh, by you know, 20, 2050, all cars, a majority of cars are going to be electric. So we had this conviction at the time because electric vehicles are just better for society and they're also better vehicles. They're much more enjoyable to drive. They're quiet, they don't see these vibrations, they don't see any noises. Um, and it's, you know, you can charge it at home. It's very comfortable, uh, very comfortable drive. And so this is something that all people should use in the future. And so to me, you know, and especially again with this, you know, all these challenges uh, with supply chain and reliance on fossil fuels, you know, now the transition is happening much faster. And so I would say that, you know, a quarter of all four vehicles or more will be electric by 2040, um, or 2030, sorry, 2030. And, and my predictions is that by 2040, you know, over 75% of vehicles will be fully electric. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, um, I'm, I'm keen to see, uh, you know, this happening. Um, but beyond, beyond electric vehicles, uh, like, and especially because this technology, you know, it's, it's amazing because, you know, when I think about it without mentioning any brand, you know, you, you can go on a single charge. I'm, I'm not sure, but like quite good uh, distance. So, but what other use cases we can see these, uh, you know, these batteries be implemented in? Uh, I mean, beyond just cars. I mean, certainly, uh, it definitely not, not just cars. Um, I think, you know, with new material technologies, the batteries become lighter over time. So this will enable electric aviation or flying taxis or flying self-driving drones, um, you know, uh, that can carry passengers. Um, so this is very special and, you know, it, it is a distant future, but it's not that distance, maybe it's within a few decades. So I think, you know, the kind of rise of the market share of electric aerial vehicles is going to start in about two decades. So by in the mid 2040s. Um, and so this is my, my expectations and it's going to be driven by the improvements in the car markets. So once you have more adoption of EVs, one, the technology matures, becomes more reliable, better, uh, safer, then, then the electric aviation is going to take hold. And similarly, I think, you know, most ships are going to become hybrid and eventually maybe fully electric by, you know, within three decades, maybe by 2050, 2030, uh, sorry, 2050, 2060s. And it's maybe it takes longer time in ships because they kind of last longer. Um, and it, you know, you require much larger batteries. Um, and you're, it's also cost sensitive, um, transportation of goods is very cost sensitive area. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and batteries also help to expand the share of renewable energy in power generation. So, you know, I think in maybe a few decades and going to exceed 75%. And this is my personal prediction. So most experts believe that it's going to be half of, of that. So they believe that you know, 40% maybe will be um, renewable energy in, in world power generation. But I think it will be more than that. I think it's going to be like 75% in, in less than three decades. Um, so lots of changes are coming. Uh, I'm keen to see, and you know, maybe it's um, uh, come to surprise, like um, I'm, I'm living in, in, in the Gulf, I'm living in Dubai, and you know, here there's a huge push uh, towards, you know, um, you know acquiring uh, this technology and, uh, and yeah, like I can say from my own, um, observation, uh, at least about Dubai, like, uh, you know, the number of electric cars, uh, increased, you know, and, uh, you know, even uh, electric buses and, uh, you know, I think that the railway that they are developing also, it will be powered by, uh, electricity. So it's, it's good to see this and, you know, to have less emissions, I would say now shifting a little bit gears that. You know, like you have a very rich background, honestly, like uh, between, you know, being a professor and being a co-founder and a CTO and it's really in chief. So uh, how, how do you navigate all these responsibilities? Like if you allow me to ask you. Uh, that's challenging. <laughs> and so, you know, I, um, I was, you know, on part-time professor, part-time, uh, CTO of Sila for some time. And now I'm in a leave of absence. I'm taking more responsibilities because now is the critical time for the company to expand, build factories, go to market. Um, and it is a ch- it's a challenge. And so no doubt about this. And so you have to be, um, you know, thoughtful. You have to delegate a lot. Uh, you have to have an amazing team uh, that you build trust with. Uh, you know, I have amazing, you know, team members at Sila, but I also have quite amazing students at, at Georgia Tech. And, you know, it's very nice to have understanding within colleagues, you know, and 
our department in our school and our college and our university in general is very supportive of entrepreneurship. And so in the past, when I joined Georgia Tech, you know, the comments I received about my involvement with the startup was very, was very negative. Many of them were like, well, you should focus on teaching. You should not focus on uh, innovations. And now everything is changing. And now, you know, administration is super supportive and super understanding. And so they gave me this opportunity to uh, the break in teaching so I can focus on the company and, and, and increase the chances for the companies to succeed uh, or accelerate the development. Uh, so this is very special for me. That's and, you know, really yeah, nice. and that, yeah, yeah I, I, won't be, I won't be able to do it without the kind of support of colleagues and support of people around me and support of the family uh, and so forth. Because it is, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is really, really, you know, like uh, um, amazing, fantastic. Yeah. I would say you mentioned something, and you know, I'm big fan of. Um, but I want also to share your insight. You mentioned like um, you know the team and hand, ha how you push them for innovation. So how how do you foster the innovation within within a team? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm I want you because, uh, by the way, you are in, maybe in, in, in one of the industries that all that you have to do is innovate all the time. But, you know, I'm asking you this question for inspiring fellow entrepreneurs about how important is innovation within whatever you are doing and spreading it to, to the team as well. Um, I can maybe comment on how to foster, you know, my view on how to foster innovations within the company, but also I can share my own tips, how sure. I can, you know, what helped me to innovate. I think for the company, you need to, um, you need to hire great talent. It's very important. You need to find people who can innovate and be very effective and, and be very collaborative because, you know, maybe in the past we had like single inventors, uh, single innovators. Now you have teams and everybody has to collaborate, work together, uh, to, to foster these innovations. And then, you know, as a manager, you have to provide them space. You have to provide them priorities. And you also have to create a culture when you build on each other ideas that you support a good idea, no matter if it's yours or somebody else's. The important part is to identify these good ideas and, and build on it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, it sounds simple, but it, it makes a huge impact. And then, you know, for myself, I uh, use two approaches. You know, first I'm, you know, very visual thinker and have kind of vivid imagination. And I like to draw things on a piece of paper or in a PowerPoint or Google slides. And in, in fact, when I was a teenager, I was, you know, considering becoming a professional artist. Um, and so even when I was drawing, I often would do it from imagination. I would invent my own landscape or structures or objects or faces rather than copy what they see. And so drawing helps me to come up with new ideas or materials or processes or reactive designs or people in design. So when, you know, before I start drawing, I might have some vague ideas, but when I start drawing, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a few minutes or in half an hour, I would typically come up with something new. So, you know, visualizing your thinking is, is typically helping, uh, to, uh, to encourage innovations, at least for me. And, and the second, I am also a very curious person. So I rely on curiosity. So I like to learn about different industries or processes, trying to understand how they work and why. So even if there's no clear connections with what I do, and then very often I find that there is some remote analogies. And, and so I can bring these ideas from very different fields and can be as diverse as pharmaceutical or I know, agricultural or food or construction or aerospace. I can bring them to, to what I have. And so it may be, maybe these analogies are initially oversimplifications. So you need to adopt and modify them for, for your application. But sometimes you, you, and sometimes you expect some trends and you do experiments and you see the opposite. But you know, when you see these trends, it's important to understand the fundamentals behind them. Because once you understand the fundamentals, you can come up with new ways, you know, simpler design, you know, cheaper ways, more elegant ways to produce and innovate in the space. So, so curiosity in combination with eagerness to understand fundamentals helped me quite a bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great insight. I, I, you know, it's a common thing, you know, after interviewing, uh, uh, great minds like yourself lab is, you know, visualization and, you know, being visual thinker. I think this is something very important. Um, and also, uh, you know, something I 
uh, always mentioned and uh, I practice as well, which is, you know, learning about different things. I think the more you are, try to understand like other things and you come back to the, to the main domain that you are in, you can excel better, I would say. So the really good insights from your side. Now, as we, we came almost to the end, Gleb, like, like um, um, is there anything that you wished I have asked you? This is my famous slot question. And how you would have answered it? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> um, I have to think about, um, I think maybe I wish you would ask about um, overall performance improvements in batteries. So maybe uh, if recycling would be, you know, yeah, a significant sure. part of it. And, you know, I would say that 90%, 99% of, of lead acid batteries are recycled. And so I expect, you know, the same fraction of lithium ion batteries will be recycled in the future. So, you know, the supply chain challenges we face now may eventually go away uh, in a few decades, you know. Um, I also expect that these new materials will enable uh, much longer cycle life and calendar life in batteries. So, you know, moving from uh, maybe 1,000 cycles for electric vehicles to five or 20,000 cycles and, you know, from 10 years to 20, 30, 40 years. And this will enable vehicle to grid integration. Uh, it will enable semi-trucks uh, as well as autonomous vehicles capable of driving millions of miles during their life. And, and I think this innovation may happen in, in less than a decade. And so in this case, you know, the cost of transportation will be reduced. So not only will we have a, um, let's say, better technology that is more environmentally friendly, but also it's going to be cheaper for, you know, uh, for everybody. Yeah, if I understood right, Greb, like, is this, you know, this battery that uh, it might, I'm not saying last forever, but, uh, you know, is it something that we can see? Like maybe 10 I mean, years battery? I mean, you see these batteries now, so many batteries that operate in satellites, they have to function for tens of thousands of cycles and operate for decades. The, the right. difference is, is that these batteries are not necessarily cheap and don't necessarily provide the best performance in terms of the energy density. And so, you know, but we can bring these improvements, we can, you know, mitigate degradation mechanisms um, in, in conventional batteries and in novel battery chemistries might be even better. And so that's why you can, you know, enable these innovations uh, in the future. That's great to hear. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, to the day that these batteries are available because, um, you know, like, uh, it's something which will be very beneficial for everyone in all industries, I would say. Well, Leb, thank you very much for uh, being my guest today on the CTO show. You've added a lot of insights and uh, I loved, you know, that we covered something I didn't do before, which is mainly about um, uh, renewable energy and uh, something related to sustainability. So thank you very much for sharing your insights and your also uh, own experience as an entrepreneur and as an innovator. Um, and as usual, this is how I end uh, my episodes for the audience. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all the feedbacks that you are sending. And if you have any uh, feedback and question, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to me. And if you are interested to be also a guest on the show, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me also as well. And then we can make an arrangement for that. Thank you very much. And uh, we will meet again in a new episode very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, it was very special for me. I really appreciate your wonderful host. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.